trend. And the idea of civil society traveled throughout the aid community in the years that followed, and it made us look beyond NGOs into a much broader web of political and social protests that make change happen. Most of my own career has been in this corner of the world studying this phenomenon. The 99% is a more recent hero on the list, and the Occupy Wall Street and other protest movements that arose following the 2008 financial crisis were parts of a civil society movement as much as they were events. This time, however, they were not organizations. They were without the usual organizational form. They were leaderless and fluid, and they were made possible in part through the medium of the internet. And the Arab Spring that followed a couple of years later was an even more concrete example of the implications of this new kind of organizing. It had leaders for sure, but the 99%-ness of the communication technology, the popular participation in the streets, made the hero of these dramatic changes far more universal. It's the ordinary person linked in a vast ecosystem of ideas and technology who had become powerful. I want to emphasize how important this change is. The idea of civil society, changes in technology, and impulse to organize outside of old organizational forms, all of this leads to a new kind of agency today. For those in this room who are leaving Trent in the next few years, you are arriving on the scene at a remarkable moment in history. Indeed, I think the conviction about the individual's ability to act is one of the major areas of change in the last 25 years. That conviction, amplified by preference to working groups, is powerful. And today may mark the peak of our belief in the power of the ordinary person, an individual working in groups. When I was in Trent, there was no World Wide Web. We didn't have email addresses. I didn't have a computer. And in my first year, I would take my handwritten papers over to Keith Stewart's house to type them on his manual uh, typewriter. The world is very different today. So how did all that change happen? Part of the reason may be generational. You might recognize this critique of the millennial generation. If you're part of the millennial generation, you don't have to raise your hand. I don't know if you can read the subtitle. The main heading is me, me, me. The subtitle says that millennials are lazy, entitled narcissists. The important bit, however, is in the other part of the magazine's description. It goes on to opine that millennials will save us all. Millennials are just adapting quickly to a world undergoing rapid technological change. The editor writes, they're optimistic, they're confident, and they're pragmatic at a time when it can be difficult just to get by. Confident, pragmatic, and in a world of rapid technological change, inclined to work in networks. That's a powerful kind of agency. This moment in time, this generation, not only believes in generating change, they believe they can. And of course, in the span of our lives, most of us can do and will do only a little bit, and in only a very little bit of our world. But that's fine. What's new, as we shall see, is that that little bit can be phenomenal. So, where are we? We accept responsibility and we believe we can as individuals make important change. Well, what's next? We now come to the dilemmas of taking action. Thus far, made responsible, convinced of our power of agency, how do we pick a path among the change strategies on offer? What tactics should we take up? So let's look at the four strategies again. And we'll begin with those of you in the room with the revolutionary slant. Overthrowing a flawed system 
peacefully, of course, requires organization and mass action. Think of the anti-racism and anti-apartheid movements. Think of the development of labor unions. Think of Gandhi's protests against British rule. What tactics were used? What actions were taken up? I want to talk about three kinds of actions for system changing, hitting the streets, undermining the foundation, and building the team. First, the practice of hitting the streets. Mass public protest is a core element of people's movements worldwide. Sometimes marchers are set upon a fundamental revolution revolutionary action, a coup, a regime change, deep of people. This is a photo of Mao speaking to the trekkers on the long march. But sometimes, however, the revolutionary target is not a leader or a system, but an idea. An idea about race, about gender, the environment. Hitting the streets becomes a tool for changing ideas about the world, another kind of revolution. Another way of changing the system is to undermine its foundation. Undermining can happen through disclosure of information, such as the controversial WikiLeaks events, and through non-participation in the system altogether. This is a famous book by James Scott describes the way that peasants and factory workers around the world engage in everyday forms of resistance. The title of his book such as foot, foot dragging, pilfering, evasion, and so on, rather than protest the system, they skirt around it. Non-participation, of course, can undermine other kinds of systems, boycotts, alternative consumer choices, use of resources, even vegetarianism, can all be elements of resistance. And I remember listing on my Peterborough fridge a sign like this one, listing all of the boycotts that I expected my housemates to observe. One complained at one point that there was then nothing left for him to eat. <laughs> A third set of tactics involves building the team. And all change work, whether revolutionary or repair-minded, involves others. Building the team can mean finding, training, leading, But I want to give you a personal example of another kind. My aunt, who died at the age of 84 a few years ago, worked with her husband at a civil rights training school in Tennessee in the 1950s. Highlander Folk School was set up to train community activists at the time of the McCarthy era. And you can imagine how well that kind of activity was received in Washington. And indeed, I was really pleased to find a recently declassified FBI report on Highlander where my aunt and uncle are named. <laughs> Anne and Ward Isaacs joined the staff, etc. But you've probably never heard of Highlander, but you have heard of this man. Martin Luther King was a promoter of Highlander's work, and here he is at the folk school under a headline of the era, Martin Luther King at Communist Training School. And you've probably heard of this woman, Rosa Parks, the black woman who wouldn't give up her seat on the bus to a white person, was trained at Highlander as part of her life's work and activism. And her arrest was a catalyzing moment in the civil rights movement. Building the team is not backseat work. Change is very much a team sport. Let's turn then to the second direction you might take up. Improving the system, the repair strategy, might also involve hitting the streets and certainly involves building the team, but what else? There are those who carry the load at the front line, those who work the machine in support of action, those who pay the bills, and those who add just that little bit more. There are people in this room who, like this community health worker in Bangladesh, are carrying the load in their communities. They are the social workers, the primary health care attendants, the community leaders, the NGO volunteers. They have devoted their full-time careers to development at home and in other parts of the world. And there are others who work in the organizations and institutions not at the front line. 
They are officials in development agencies or health departments or socially responsible business managers, lawyers, shareholder activists who work the machine. This is the part of the world where I now sit. There are also those who give not time or careers to development, but their money. And in small and large amounts, philanthropy is an enormous part of the international development project. In recent years, we've seen a phenomenal growth in the gifts of small and large philanthropists alike. I've had two glasses of wine, and I'm not going to try to say philanthropist too many more times. <laughs> I want you to have a look at this chart. The flows from foundations and from individuals and NGOs is now almost a quarter of the world's ODA figures, almost 30 billion in 2010. And those philanthropists include the ones you know already, like the Gates Foundations, but those you may not yet know. Aliko Dangote, Africa's richest man, is worth a reported $24 billion. And in 2012, Forbes identified him as the continent's greatest philanthropist, giving away an estimated $35 million for causes including relief from flooding and support for housing for the urban poor. But philanthropists are both rich and the not so rich. The flow of remittances, the money that the not so well paid foreign workers send back home to their family and friends, swamps the flow of the big money types. So if $30 billion went out from the big philanthropists, more than 10 times that amount, $325 billion to developing countries in 2010 alone came from the small contributions of family and friends. It's now the largest source of external financing in developing countries. These flows of money, large and small, can make a powerful difference. But change agents don't need to be full-time, nor do they need to participate with their wallets. There are other small efforts that can bring cumulative change. I must admit I got this book out of the library because I thought the title was so funny, The One Hour Activist. After eight years in the university in development studies, I thought I could have taken some shortcuts, but I only needed to do it in one hour. But this book talks about all those activities that are part of our citizenship that we can take up. They write into our city council, to our MLA, to our MP, volunteering in our community, sitting on committees. The One Hour Activist is crucial for the functioning of our communities. But there's another way of contributing, the one-hour contribution. that was inconceivable in 1990 when there wasn't yet a web and emails had only just begun. And I want to spend a little bit more time on this idea of the little bit. IT guru Clay Sharkey talks about the amazing idea of cognitive surplus. And he wonders what would happen if we donated just a bit of it. Cognitive surplus is that extra time and that extra brain power we have in a year that we can devote to something bigger. Sharkey uses the example of Ushahidi, an internet platform that was started in Kenya that allowed individuals to text flashpoints of election violence. It's the same platform that helped find <coughs> survivors under the rubble in Haiti, and today tracks fatalities in Syria. Through this technology, and thousands like it, unrelated individuals can immediately create something of profound social value. Sharkey muses about the civic potential of a trillion free hours every year. The minutes of surplus we donate do not need to be trivial. They can be an incredibly valuable resource for humanity. The third change strategy follows on an ecosystem understanding of global events and their impacts. If we believed that small actions, not only good in themselves, had a larger impact on the globe, a ripple on its surface, what would we do? I want to show how small acts matter for three very big reasons. Q, 
cumulative impact, social capital, and the tipping point. The first kind of ripple tactic is the small act. And certainly the small acts of kindness are crucial for any society to function. But the appeal is more than a sentimental one. It can, if cumulative, make an enormous difference. The sharing of information on Syria, for example. Or this other example. When Malaysian Airlines Flight 370 suddenly vanished, the firm Digital Globe uploaded satellite images onto the web and crowdsourced the digital search for signs of aircraft. An astounding 8 million volunteers rallied online and they searched through 775 million images spanning, in, spanning a million square kilometers in four days. These outcomes allow us to see our own agency in action, even when each action is small. When added up, they are large. There's a second way that small acts matter. Social capital, an idea popularized by Harvard academic Robert Putnam more than 15 years ago, shows that the social links among people matter. Being in a choir together, volunteering on a committee, these activities generate more than good feeling. They generate measurable outcomes in terms of health, employment, safety. And the implication of the idea for development was taken up by, with great fervor by the World Bank and by others. And the idea was to understand better how all those social connections, that soft stuff, that unmeasurable stuff, could actually increase development outcomes and then how best to support the growth of social capital. And they found, for instance, that schools are more effective when parents and local citizens are actively involved, teachers are more committed, students achieve higher test scores, better use is made of school facilities. There's a third way in which the ripple strategy matters, the tipping point. And this idea popularized by Malcolm Gladwell is the notion that a small thing can make a big thing happen and sometimes happen on purpose. Gladwell describes the tipping point as the moment when an idea, a trend, social behavior crosses a threshold and begins to spread like wildfire. And just as a single sick person can start an epidemic of the flu, so too can a small event cause a fashion trend popularity of a new product, a drop in the crime rate, an increase in suicide. And he describes how certain types of people in certain circumstances can help turn a smoking trend upside down or turn unexpected fashion ideas into epidemics. Actually, in Gladwell's book, he talks about the fashion trend of hush puppies. However, my own personal curiosity is how crocs happened, so I've replaced the photograph. The idea of a tipping point is important to us here today in this room because it points to a strategy of smarting, starting small, even in a complex ecosystem, but with the possibility of ending up somewhere much better. We can be part of an academic, epidemic of change. And for those in the room making decisions about their own change making, it's important, important to acknowledge that small things, like matches, can matter. We come now to the last strategic option of tuning out. What tactics to deploy to organize inaction? <laughs> I actually couldn't think of one single thing, although I had some fun imagining how you could organize in order to do nothing and wondered if nihilists had committees. But I did find a cartoon. <laughs> the poor man can't even get a t-shirt. So, that's all fine and dandy. How do we get from a list of theories, strategies, and tactics to making decisions about our own course in life? How do I decide? Even if I'm committed to a particular cause, Surely it matters choosing one tactic or another or choosing them in the right order 
or at the right time. Making these kinds of choices isn't easy. That's why there are dilemmas. And there are many reasons why those decisions are particularly hard to make. The first reason is diagnostic uncertainty. <laughs> How certain are you of the strength of your own conviction, your own commitment to a particular worldview? Are you fixed in your assessment of the way to change the world? How positive are you? That's diagnostic uncertainty. We're just not sure we're right. The second reason the choice is difficult is the impossibility of forecasting success. It's a gamble. We cannot know if the choice we are making will be the right one, the best choice, the one most likely to bring success, to bring positive, meaningful change in the world. We're gambling. The third reason that decisions are hard is the Sisyphean dilemma. Not only can I not guarantee that my choice is the right one, worse, I can't guarantee it won't be utterly fruitless. How can I avoid the Sisyphean path, pushing that same boulder up that same hill? And of course, frustration in any life is inevitable. The flip side of the idea of agency, the conviction that I can do something, is the idea of constraint. The reality that you can't do everything. The fourth reason that these decisions are difficult is the presence of other ambitions. I think of this as commitment to competition. Am I selling out if I want security, family, comfort? Can I have it all? For example, I hear that little people are expensive to raise. Uh, these are actually my own children, but I've yet to calculate how much they've cost. <laughs> Of course, most of our commitments are not choices at all. We all face illness, straining, financial insecurity, family responsibilities that command our attention, and we will not always be able to be engaged in the wider world or to be engaged with our fullest energy. I often have days where I think folding the laundry constitutes a major achievement. But some of the time, we do have choices about our goals in the wider world. So how do we navigate those choices? Do we pick door number one, door number two, door number three? So here are some thoughts I've borrowed from other people about how to make hard choices. And there are at least two approaches, depending on the kind of person you are. The first is the most familiar. Rational choice approaches help us take apart a decision, and put values on various components. This is the kind of approach that values makes pros and cons lists. And there are dozens of methods that fall in this category. And I'm a super type A sort of person, so I love lists. And indeed, I even like decision matrices. <laughs> this matrix, Somebody put up on the internet to show you how to decide where to go on a holiday. <laughs> so here's the question. Where should we go? Here are the considerations. It can't be too expensive. We'd like to go somewhere warm. We're going we're to value all those. Florida got 21 points. We're going to Florida. <laughs> I'm not used. It's a little bit embarrassing to admit in public, but I used exactly this thing to decide what job to take once. <laughs> the second set of methods is normative. And all normative approaches start with an examination of the decision maker's values rather than the intrinsic qualities of the options that are on the table. And here the choice is not made on the merits of the alternatives, a is better than B, but on the values of the person making the decision. Philosopher Ruth Chang does a fabulous TED talk 
about making hard decisions. I actually really wish they had TED Talks when I was at university because I figured that would have covered most of my coursework. <laughs> I mean, and I say this knowing several of my professors are in the room. Um, <laughs> this talk illustrates the dilemma of making a career choice. So she puts up a, a, a comparison between a hypothetical decision of taking up a career in the arts or in banking. But at the end of the day, one job isn't objectively better than the other. The apple isn't actually better than the orange, you can't put values on them. Florida doesn't get to 21. What makes the decision is the value package of the decision maker. I am a person who values A more than B. I like apples more than oranges. I value art more than banking. And in my own case, the job choice I made through that earlier matrix approach ended up being a bad one for normative reasons, I hadn't figured in that I didn't like my boss very much. And anyone who calls on a rocking chair test is using a kind of normative method. You know, it's the imagination exercise where you're asked to project into the future. Imagine yourself sitting on a rocking chair, looking back with pride or with regret at the decisions you've made over your life. And for those in this room who are making life decisions now, it's important to rally both approaches to your decision making. Some alternatives may yield more hope for progress, more impact, better wages, more travel, more experiences, things that you might be able to weigh up, but there will always be normative choices to make. Each of us needs to know what we value most. I want to end my time with you by talking about why those decisions matter. So let me go back to the beginning to see where I've ended up. I tried to show that development studies like those that we do here at Trent present at least four different kinds of worldview. And those four worldviews suggest at least four kinds of change strategy and many kinds of actions that can be put on the table to turn those strategies into positive, meaningful change. And in the middle of all that, I mused out loud about the whole idea of obligation, in the first place, the need of doing anything at all, and through the process of responsabilization and agency, there is today a stronger belief in the idea of the powerful individual, linked to millions, working in the center of the stream, or contributing from the trillions of hours that float free in our world. And I ended up just a minute ago by talking about the challenge, the art of decision making, of picking a way among obstacles to finding the